Red Bull dominant again after years of struggle and Mercedes now declining after years of success. This stark contrast suggests the process of entropy has set in, that the energy that produces long-term success inevitably begins to dissipate once that success has been achieved, overwhelmed by the hungry ambition of the next generation. This is a pretty good summary of what happened to Ross Braun, Michael Schumacher, Jean Todt era Ferrari in the 2000s. They achieved massive success together, but eventually ran out of steam, the old magic faded, and the team slowly came apart. But when looking at what's happened to Mercedes and Red Bull, the entropy model works only on a superficial level. The particular underlying circumstances are quite different. Before the advent of the hybrid power unit formula, Red Bull was F1's dominant team, winning four consecutive world titles with Sebastian Vettel. Red Bull didn't cease to be that force through any loss of determination, lack of energy or change in personnel. It happened virtually overnight in 2014, when the new formula changed the main differentiator of success from aerodynamics to power unit. Aero was still of course hugely important, but if the lap time difference between a good chassis and a great one was say 0.5 seconds and the difference in power unit was say twice or three times that, then even a genius like Adrian Newey struggled to overcome a deficit that significant. Red Bull was powered by Renault, which totally underestimated the challenge of hybrid engines. The hybrid equation was far more complex than met the eye, even for the most experienced of engine designers, and those complexities had some profound implications. After targeting a very low plenum temperature for maximum turbo performance on its initial engine, Mercedes realised that the implication for the aerodynamics at the required level of cooling made that target counterproductive. This led the team to discard its initial engine and car concept and start again, from scratch, with three technical directors, power unit, chassis and overall, working hand in hand and long, long lead times on design, the process of integration was refined and re-refined. Starting way later, and with a much lower budget, the Renault not only lacked the imaginative split turbo format of the Mercedes with its turbo jet ignition, but Renault's internal combustion engine was nowhere near as good at dealing with the damaging side effects of the complex combustion process within these new V6 engines, and the resultant power shortfall snowballed into less efficient energy recovery too. The Renault engine was also terribly unreliable. As Renault engineers attended to the power shortfall as a first order problem, so reliability remained desperately poor. Even as late as 2016, the third season of hybrid V6 engines, Renault was still unable to produce an efficient and reliable MG UK. It was only halfway through that season that Renault finally introduced turbojet ignition technology, which benefited both power and fuel economy. Renault's off-pace development, combined with the fact its engine had much higher cooling demands than the Mercedes unit did, meant Red Bull was placed at an enormous competitive disadvantage. Mercedes had its own engine facility and had invested years and hundreds of millions of dollars in preparing for that challenge. The new hybrid formula was the meteorite which changed everything, a sudden and fundamental paradigm shift which upended the status quo. Mercedes with its industrial scale resource, its huge ambition and its F1 program directed by the wily Ross Braun was not going to miss that opportunity. Red Bull, a colossus of a racing team, but without the engineering might and long-term strategic perspective of an automotive corporate giant, was not in charge of its destiny to anything like the same extent. Red Bull had not lost ambition, but it had lost the firing power to translate that ambition into success. The difference in scale was physically manifest in the difference in performance of the respective power units. The Mercedes was literally about five years ahead in technology. But it was way more than just that. The implications snowballed as Mercedes was able to use the long lead times to integrate the chassis and power unit departments. Clever people were allocated massive budgets to squeeze all the potential from that integration at an organisational level which translated to the cars. Mercedes had great aero and massive power. Red Bull had just great aero. No contest. Even though the Mercedes engine advantage inevitably dwindled as the hybrid formula matured and other manufacturers figured out what to do, the aerodynamic path that that early advantage had set Mercedes on led to some great cars. Those of 2016 and 2020 were particularly outstanding. In the early hybrid years, Mercedes was innovating in terms of front suspension aerodynamics and super compact side pods, a profile made possible by that clever split turbo engine design, meaning the plumbing route for the car's cooling requirements could be massively simplified. In 2016, a two-piece bolt 
bulkhead, actually an innovation of backmark and Mercedes customer team manner, allowed Mercedes to fit a powerful hydraulic heave spring, giving the car spectacular control of its aero platform. Asymmetric valving, which was banned ahead of 2017, allowed the front of the car to remain low even after the brakes had been released, only rising back up slowly after the corner had been completed. This allowed a forward bias center of aerodynamic pressure to be maintained even at slower speeds where a low rate car, which the Mercedes was, would normally begin to lose time through understeer. And very much unlike now, in 2016, Mercedes was leading the way in floor design too. What was termed the W floor of the 2016 car featured a hugely intricate arrangement of serrated veins ahead of the side pod. Each of these were connected to separate points at the leading edge of the floor, allowing some of the airflow arriving at the side pod area to be filtered off in a controlled way to the underbody, boosting downforce. The Mercedes W07 was actually probably a more aerodynamically advanced car than that year's Red Bull, and even normalizing for Red Bull's power deficit, Mercedes reckoned its car was still the quickest at all but two tracks. They wouldn't tell us which two exactly, but we can take a pretty good guess that at least one of those circuits was Monaco, the only place all season a Mercedes failed to qualify on pole position. Mercedes 2020 car featured dual axis steering, allowing the driver to change the toe angle of the front wheels between two set positions to help with tyre warm up before a qualifying lap or prior to a safety car restart. But actually far more significant was the car's completely reworked rear suspension, which had been swept back dramatically to create more downforce generating area around the diffuser. This had been done by locating the inboard end of the rear lower wishbone into the crash structure rather than the gearbox. It became an industry standard, but was unique to Mercedes in 2020. Red Bull's own aerodynamic mastery remained intact, but could not be fully exploited when trying to compensate for such a big power shortfall. Even in those years where they managed to create a more aerodynamically effective car than Mercedes, any advantage would be dwarfed by that numbing power gap. In 2014, this deficit was about 80 horsepower, a huge amount, but even as Renault reduced that gap, Mercedes remained comfortably ahead, and by 2016, its power unit was reckoned to be worth around half a second a lap compared to the Renault. By 2018, Red Bull was conceiving a car with an aerodynamic map deliberately skewed towards the sort of slow corner circuits on which its power shortfall wouldn't be so costly. Skewing their aero map in this way meant Red Bull were actually faster than Mercedes in Monaco and Hungary, despite being significantly slower than Mercedes on average over the course of the season. Red Bull's lack of faith in Renault's promises meant its cars had built-in compromises, in addition to the horsepower deficit, as narrow windows of opportunity were sought. Title ambitions were simply unrealistic. It was like trying to find the fastest way to run the 100 meters with a stone in your shoe, painful and not the best use of your time. With that engine deficit baked in, the focus had to be on minimizing its effects rather than chasing the ultimate level of performance. Red Bull was further hampered by regulation change. The new wide car regulations of 2017 led to a wind tunnel correlation problem as the data was corrupted by the closer proximity of the wider model to the tunnel walls. It led Red Bull to skew its lift drag trade off too far towards drag, and it took most of the season to claw that downforce deficit back once the tunnel problem had been identified and corrected. The 2019 restrictions on the number of undernose guide vanes, the banning of blown axles, and lowered height of the barge boards hit harder at Red Bull's high rake short wheelbase car philosophy than Mercedes low rake long wheelbase concept. The airflow being fed from the front wing to barge boards and underfloor, already challenged by having less distance in which to turn, was even further handicapped without these air accelerating devices. But that would be overturned to quite spectacular effect by the regulation trimming of the floor area for 2021, which hurt Mercedes and at just the time Red Bull's relationship with Honda was blossoming. The cutting of the outer floor in a diagonal line from the front to the rear robbed the long wheelbase Mercedes of more downforce producing floor area than the Red Bull. Added to that was the late notice restriction on the height of the strakes on the rear brake ducts. Not so damaging on a high rate car like the Red Bull, where the diffuser comes up with the car on its suspension to get closer to the brake duct, but very definitely a further blow to any low rate car like the Mercedes was, as that little aero tool had just lost a whole lot of its power with a snip of F1's regulatory scissors. By this time fully aligned with Honda, an engine partner in which it had complete faith, Red Bull's engine power and integration had improved year on year, and with that final bit of regulatory help, Red Bull was now a Mercedes match at last. Finally, Red Bull had great aero and a great power unit, and 2021 was of course one of the most spectacular and controversial title fights in F1 history. 
Now it's Mercedes' turn to stumble, and there's a clear similarity in that a specific set of regulations, this time ground effect floors, has appeared to suddenly transform Mercedes from title contender to also ran. But the big difference between what's happening at Mercedes and what happened to Red Bull is that Mercedes isn't a victim of the poor preparation and technical inferiority of an external supplier or partner. A fundamental shift in regulations, this time on the chassis rather than the engine, is at the root, but Mercedes still had the necessary tools, structures and people in place to be master of its own destiny, and yet fell spectacularly short of expectations. Mercedes went down the rabbit hole of simulating and chasing the highest peaks of theoretical downforce from these new cars, but then literally ran aground. Red Bull was the only team to immediately grasp the secret was not going to be generating the highest theoretical downforce, but the most consistent over the full range of ride heights, roll, pitch, dive, yaw and steering. This required a much more sophisticated underfloor design than Mercedes came up with, and a more compliant rear suspension. Mercedes still had a competitive engine, but an aerodynamic penalty it struggled to fully understand. So now you have a team that was once an aerodynamic match for Red Bull, but which has lost its grasp with the chassis regulations. Throughout its own lean period, Red Bull never lost its own grip on F1's aerodynamic battleground to anywhere near the same extent. Technical director James Allison believes Mercedes has finally corrected this aberration over the winter of 2023, but with no way of knowing what advances Red Bull may have made in the meantime to stretch even further ahead, potentially locking in the sort of dominance on the chassis side that Mercedes once enjoyed to spectacular effect on the engine side. So now we all wait to see if Mercedes has finally understood and unlocked the secrets to these latest ground effect F1 cars and whether that is enough to mean it really is game on once again between these two great F1 teams.